Mr. Chairman, nice to see you, sir. Uh, thanks for having me. The new report, sir, is out on Afghanistan, what happened. Um, what did the military recommend in August of 2021 that we do? You know, the commander in chief told the military to retrograde. By mid-July, they were almost completed with the mission. So as the military is evacuating and uh, the air support and the contractors, uh, he announces we're going to zero uh, by problem is the State Department, who is charged by federal law to come up with an evacuation plan, had wholly failed to do so. Uh, many uh, conversations were had between General Milley, General McKenzie, General Miller. Conditions on the ground are getting very severe, very grim, or as the State Department, because evacuation means failure, uh, had rose-colored lenses on, did not want to admit there was a problem until the Taliban overran Kabul. That is the day they call for the emergency evacuation plan. Well, it seems to me, though, that one of the families would be no expectation um, of what actually happened, that no one expected that the Taliban was going to take over Kabul so quickly. Is that a military failure? Is that a State Department failure? Or is that just bad luck? State Department failure. They, they failed. That's what we call willful blindness. Uh, willful blindness means, you know, it's, it's actually happening in reality, but you're putting blinders on the reality of the situation. And that's precisely going up. You know, the, the chief of mission, Ambassador Wilson, um, has the primary responsibility to call for the evacuation plan. He failed to do so. And he finally does this when the Taliban is approaching the embassy. He goes to H. Kaya, one of the first ones, he leaves his Afghan partners behind at the embassy, along with thousands of classified documents and thousands of passports that were burnt um, and left the country as a coward. But this, this Can is I what led to the chaos. Let me say one second. You say that the ambassador left the country. I have read, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that he said he had COVID and that there's been a suspicion of a fake COVID, COVID so that he could then leave the country leaving everybody else behind. Did he have COVID? Did he fake COVID? Or is that just a false report? He had COVID. He flew from H. Kaya to Doha. Uh, he wanted to get out. So he got one of his subordinates to fake a COVID test that was normal, that would allow him to escape Doha to get back to the United States and leave behind all the personnel at the embassy, all the American citizens, Afghan partners, and all the women. What, what a coward. Oh, President Biden, um, could he have pulled the plug before we got to the catastrophic point or we were so far into the military action with the retrograde that there was nothing else we could do? We had to go forward. Well, you know, I think the, the, the generals on the ground had to make a decision with only, uh, you know, 2,500 troops then going down to 1,000. You cannot maintain H. Kaya and Bagram at the same time. Uh, so as they were winding down to just embassy 500 uh, soldiers, they had to make that tough decision. Um, they did surge the airport after the evacuation plan was in place, but by then it's too late. And what they left in place was the Taliban were put in charge of the first checkpoint to check for passports, visas, legal paperwork. The Taliban. So if you're an Afghan ally, what do you think the Taliban is going to do to you? Whoever gets through then goes to the consular's offices. And the Marines are brought in to protect H. Kaya. And of course, on that fateful day, we all knew there was an imminent threat that day, including the time of the suicide bomb attack. And those courageous children were left out to dry. Going back to the Trump administration, the original uh, deal or plan that President Trump had, uh, had set forth, um, and it, it was a deal with the Taliban, and that was, I think, in January of 2021. Then President Biden comes into office. Um, I suspect that he could have changed that plan along the way. There's, he, was not, he was not legally bound to do that plan. Is that correct? Nothing, uh, no reason. He could have changed it. Well, how about remain in Mexico? 
But I'm just, I'm trying to understand. Point is, yes, of course he, he could, could have changed, changed it. Okay, he could have changed it. The only reason I ask is because uh, President Biden and Biden-Harris administration blame President Trump in part for that. So I'm, what I'm getting to, is that a fair, is that a fair uh, criticism of President Trump? I don't think so. Uh, and I'll tell you why. I think on day one, Biden was determined on a campaign promise to go to zero. His spokesperson, in fact, said that. He says, quote, and it's in the report, Doha was immaterial. We were going to go to zero regardless. So what they're doing now, blaming President Trump for Doha, really had nothing to do with the president's decision to completely evacuate and go to zero. Secondly, Doha had conditions, one of which, importantly, was if the Taliban is attacking U.S. forces, they are in violation of the agreement, and therefore we will not uh, evacuate. So what happened in the latter stages, stages of the Trump administration was the Taliban was hitting our military. So he says, President, I will keep 2,500 troops there and 6,500 NATO and the air cover and the contractors, which then stabilize Afghanistan. We heard the testimony from Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, the CENTCOM commander, to General Milley and Miller that that amount of, of troops could keep Afghanistan stabilized. But what happened was a complete um, evisceration of Doha, a complete go to zero, um, and then we saw a quick overrun of the country, lost our eyes and ears on the ground, had Bagram prisons released, thousands of ISIS released out of the prisons. At, at what point, though, I mean, um, is, at what point could, the, could President Biden have said, this isn't a good plan, and regrouped? I don't think he ever had any intention of doing Well, that. he may not have, but I'm just thinking it's sort of in the continuum of when he should have had, had noticed, like, should he have made the, recognized in May that this wasn't going to work, thereby preventing what happened with the prisons being overrun and the Taliban being released, and then in August with the, what happened um, at the evacuation with the, with the 13. Oh, yeah, and I think, you know, in the spring going into the summer, there were many warning signs <clears throat> along the way could have changed course, but that was not his, his goal at the end of the day. The warning signs were coming up, and I received them as well back in that summer. The generals were warning. They didn't agree with the decision. The intelligence community were warning about this. But it was going up, truth from the ground, manipulated by career, I'm sorry, political appointees, then going to the National Security Council, where a lie was perpetrated to the American people that everything was fine in Afghanistan. Everything is going to go according to plan. All contingencies have been dealt with. You won't see, like Vietnam, helicopters going off rooftops. Everything they said was a lie. In, as, when you go back in history, you oftentimes find instances when vice presidents disagree with presidents, but they do so in privately in, in matters of war because the president ultimately has the word. Obviously, we're in, a, we're in an election cycle, a pretty heated one. Do you have any indication or investigation whether or not president, whether Vice President Harris was in any disagreement with the way that President Biden was deciding how to do this evacuation? So does she have any, does she have any fingerprints on this in sort? She was the last person in the room uh, to leave after the decision was made said that she was 100% in agreement. In fact, just two weeks ago, called the evacuation courageous and successful. How anybody could call this evacuation successful is willful blindness. Did any member of the military tell the president um, in July or August, this is a really bad idea, we shouldn't do it. But then, of course, as commander-in-chief, he gets the last word. But did anyone tell him no? This is where our investigation is leading. It's not over. Right? We're going to continue this after the election. Uh, Secretary Blinken is now fighting me. I had to subpoena him. I will hold him in contempt if I have to. We believe all roads lead to the National Security Council. Every witness we had to come testify said that all decisions, the nerve center was the National Security Council. Who's the chairman? 
the National Security Advisor, Jake Sullivan. So all roads lead there, and they lead into the inner sanctum of the White House. Mr. Chairman, what's the fallout? I obviously, I understand for the, for the military and certainly for the families and those who have lost their lives, but what's sort of the, the big fallout for right. us? So a lot of people compare this to Saigon. That was a disaster. Uh, but in many ways, this is far worse because of the long-term foreign policy implications of what happened. When Afghanistan fell, not only did thousands of ISIS-K get released from the prisons, who we are now finding at our southwest border, eight of whom were detained in the United States, but also our adversaries and enemies have now been emboldened because what they saw in Afghanistan was weakness. When Putin saw Afghanistan fall, he knew this was his time. And within months, we saw the Russian Federation moving into Ukraine, forging an unholy alliance with Chairman Xi to threaten Taiwan and the Pacific, unifying with the Ayatollah in the Middle East in this unholy alliance with Hamas, Hezbollah, Houthi rebels, and then we have October the 7th. This is not, this all is not separate. This is all interconnected, and it all began with the fall of Afghanistan. And I just note the irony, October 7th, which you mentioned in Israel, that's the day the United States first bombed in Afghanistan was October 7th, 2001. That's right. the day. Um, I mean, one, of, one of the things that I've noticed in, in my work is uh, many of the people that we left behind who helped us, the Afghans. I, I was down at the, the, Colum the border, Nikokli, which, uh, which is the gate point um, to, the, to get up to the United States, to walk up to the United States, the Darien Gap. And, and I heard stories about people from Afghanistan trying to get to the United States because sort of we'd promised them with a nod and a wink. And then you've got the situation where when the Taliban prisons were overrun, those who got out are now hunting down the prosecutors that we trained to prosecute them, try to kill them because they put them in prison. I mean, there's a, there's a huge human cost that people aren't, that we're not talking about. So now we have, you know, we are denied governable space to, to ISIS. We destroyed the caliphate. Trump did. Now we see a resurgence in Afghanistan. Where they're going now is called the Khorasan region. That's the external operations. That's Tajikistan, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. This is the most dangerous spot. This is where they are coming through into our hemisphere and up through our southern border. When I chaired Homeland for three terms, I worried about this, but we never saw it. Now we are seeing it, and it's a ticking time bomb, and that's who we know about. But now with our adversaries emboldened and empowered, we could be on, on the cusp of World War III in the Pacific. That's how dangerous this whole thing was. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you.